This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over the counter markets at RVLGF. Lies on the 10 year and the US dollar. Will the reflation trade continue or are we approaching a risk off environment? The Fed is talking about talking about raising interest rates. The US dollar has spiked. The US 10 year is at 1.48%. So that is 0.02% lower than last week. The lower that goes, the more this reflation trade gets called into question, at least by the bond market. At least that's my interpretation. And a stronger dollar, of course, means weaker commodity prices. And that's what we're seeing. So very interesting dynamic as always. Well, hello and welcome to the Northern Miner podcast where we question all these things and we bring it all down to the metals that you care about and that you're probably invested in. Our bread and butter at the Northern Miner are these small cap mining stocks. And we know that when this stuff takes a hit, it usually takes a pretty enormous hit. So I am here to help you make sense of it. Uh, Crypto markets are reeling from this Chinese crackdown, it's, it looks like that is the reason. I mean, the chart people, the technical people will say it purely has to do with technical analysis and the news actually is the excuse, but really it's all technical. Uh, but this Chinese crackdown is pretty serious. It sounds like they are going to ban crypto transactions. Uh, and how I interpret that is they're banning the off-ramp because China is big into crypto And if they all of a sudden can't get rid of their coins or can't turn it back into fiat, that presents a bit of a problem for them. And so we are seeing really interesting valuations there. So it's a pretty interesting summer that's getting lined up here. The Fed is talking about talking about raising interest rates in 2023 or something like that. And that, you know, what does that say about the stock market and about financial markets when the very possibility of an interest rate hike, which would probably be a quarter of a percent, is going to create consternation. I would think another way of looking at it is you have almost two more years, at least, of this extraordinarily generous monetary policy. So, The plot thickens as always here. We have very interesting feature content today. We have Ken Hoffman from McKinsey, and he is their metals expert. And he talks to Frick Ells, who is the executive editor of Mining.com. And they talk about the nickel market. And, you know, it's back to this, I feel like an old saw here talking about, like, I, I still don't understand why we can't build a smelter in Canada. I mean, Ken Hoffman is saying it's easier to find a mine than to build a smelter in the West. And I understand that, you know, nobody wants it in their backyard. But if we're concerned about pollution, I think the mentality should be, let's build the most environmental smelter in the world. And let's be leaders in that. Surely, between the private sector and the public sector, we can put that $1 to $2 billion together. Surely that's possible. And surely, you know, with all our great universities, with all our talent, leaders supposedly in the mining world, surely we can build that. Surely we can build a nickel smelter in Canada and we can do it kind of maybe a little bit far away. It's an enormous country. We have the intellectual resources. We have the financial resources. I mean, as Ken Hoffman said, the West barely has, what does he say? There's only a few smelters in the West. (laughs) There are only a few nickel smelters in the West, you know? And so 
As far as the environmental argument, we have to remember that if we don't do it, if Canada doesn't do it, then we're going to be relying on maybe Indonesia. And I don't know Indonesia's standards. Are they going to be the ESG friendliest uh, nation when it comes to nickel smelting? Can Canada do better? Because if we can, then that is the environmental solution. That will have a net benefit, even if we pollute in Canada. But if we are polluting less, that is a net benefit. Because at the end of the day, these cars are going to be built. Unless we're going to stop that, then it's the environmental choice. So Ken goes deep into that with Frick, and it's pretty interesting. So a very fun episode coming up. I hope you're enjoying your summer. I go for my second shot tomorrow. Uh, I heard the second Pfizer shot can be a little bit trickier. Who knows? But man, am I excited. I'm looking at plane tickets and man, they're going up quickly. The prices are almost tripling in the last three weeks. So everybody's getting shots and getting excited to get out of town. And so am I. So with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner. You can find us on Instagram at The Northern Miner. And you can also find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts, and also SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. And turning to the website, China is saying they are going to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060 and peak carbon emissions by 2030. This is by Henry Lazenby, the Northern Miner. It says here, China's journey to carbon neutrality will involve a major shift towards renewable energy, says a team of analysts at London-based business intelligence company CRU. It is a journey defined by electrification and renewable energy, says the analyst in a white paper sent to mining.com. CRU has flagged solar power as having the largest potential for driving growth in the aluminum industry. Hydrogen energy is expected to be widely used in the steelmaking sector, but these technologies are not commercially viable for now. According to the Chinese government's plan, energy generation from non-fossil fuels will reach 20% by 2025 and 25% by 2030. That's pretty good. I mean, 2025 is not that far away, and they think 20% of their energy will be generated by non-fossil fuels. According to CRU, the key to, quote, peak carbon emissions, end quote, is to reduce and control carbon emissions from both the demand and supply side of the commodities market. The carbon emissions from steel making and aluminum smelting account for 98% of the total carbon emissions in the Chinese metal industry. Steel making alone accounts for 80% of emissions, with the aluminum smelting industry accounting for 18%. Therefore, it is essential for both steel and aluminum to find an efficient way to reduce carbon emissions, says C CRU. So maybe this is the issue, is maybe a smelter is so extraordinarily polluting, maybe this is the reason why Canada or the West is not building smelters. But again, I think we should just have as a goal, let's build the best, the most environmentally friendly smelter. Continuing on, on the con consumption side, decarbonization efforts require building a low carbon infrastructure on which the economy can operate. That includes smart grids, solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles and electric vehicles, infrastructure that requires more aluminum and copper metal volumes, quote, we expect consumption of aluminum and copper and low carbon infrastructure to increase by 40% and 292% respectively between 2020 and 2030. Unlike base metals, total steel demand will not be a huge beneficiary of green policy, although there will be increased demand for certain niche metals. So there is a lot more in that article. You can find it on northernminer.com, Chinese peak carbon by 2030. And this is interesting. Serbia is going to become Europe's number two copper producer uh, because of this Kukaru Peki mine. It's by Cecilia Jamazmi. And this is also owned by China, interestingly. This is, you know, we hear the drip drip of uh, China really buying up metals assets around the world. And this is just an example. So you think, okay, Serbia is going to build the second biggest copper mine 
in Europe, Kukaru Peki, and then you read on, Serbia Zijin Mining, a wholly owned subsidiary of China's Zijin Mining, has obtained a permit from the Serbian government to start mining activities at the Kukaru Peki Copper and Gold Mine, which is part of the Timok Project. Serbia's mining ministry said the country would become Europe's second largest copper producer once the mine kicks off operations. Kukaru Peki was originally slated to begin production in the summer of 2021, and the mine is now expected to start production in the fourth quarter of the year. The Serbian government anticipates the country's booming mining sector will start generating between 4 and 5% of its total GDP in less than 10 years, a significant increase from its current 2%. Zijin's local subsidiary currently operates the country's sole copper complex, RTB Bor. So, like, their all their copper industry is owned by China or Zijin Mining. So now they're investing, and you know, frankly, they probably bought it on the free market. So we're not buying it. So it's hard to really blame them. Uh, Serbia sold it, or whoever someone sold it to them. So. And finally, Serbia Zijin Copper has committed to invest $408 million this year, up from $360 million in 2020, to overhaul and expand its four mines and a smelter. So basically, they're doing it. You know, China is doing this in Serbia. They're putting in, last year, they put in $360 million, and this year they're putting $408 million. So this is how it's done. This is how you build a smelter. You put in a couple of billion dollars. And you do it. The plan also includes improving environmental protection in the heavily polluted Bor region in Serbia's east. So there you go. Uh, you know, all these stories, it's almost one big story, isn't it? Now, moving on, Canada's Coal Association responds to Ottawa's thermal coal mine ban. It's also by Henry Lazenby. The Coal Association of Canada says Ottawa's recent ban on new thermal coal mining projects or plans to expand existing mines on environmental damage grounds will lead to the market gap left being filled with inferior quality coal from elsewhere. It's the same story, folks. Uh, just different commodity. According to the association's president, Robin Campbell, Canadian thermal coal is considered extremely high quality and has a low sulfur content relative to world standards. Quote, the loss of coal from Canada will likely be replaced by production from other countries that do not have the same commitment to our high standards, end quote. He said in a statement in response to the federal announcement on June 11th. In announcing the new policy measure, Environment Minister Jonathan Wilkinson said the power-making bulk product was the single most contributor to climate change. Quote, the continued mining of and use of thermal coal for energy production energy in the world runs counter to what is needed to effectively combat climate change and seize the economic opportunity that it presents. The policy is in line with regulations unveiled in 2018 by the Canadian government to phase out traditional coal-fired electricity by 2030. Government data ranks Canada as the world's fourth largest exporter of metallurgical or steel-making coal at 57 million tons in 2019, of which 37 million tons were exported and a further 8 million tons were imported. Alberta and BC produced 83% of Canada's met coal, comprising 47% thermal coal and 53% metallurgical coal. So let's see if the next story is anything different. Rio Tinto opens new scandium plant in Quebec. It's by Maryland Scales. Rio Tinto has started up its new commercial scale demonstration plant to produce high quality scandium oxide. The plant is located at its Rio Tinto Fair a Titan metallurgical complex in Sorel Tracy, Quebec. The $6 million project was completed on time and on budget less than six months after the start of construction. The Quebec government contributed $650,000 to the project through its development plan for critical and strategic minerals. It is almost a continuation of our previous story and our, our opening thoughts there. It all seems to be the same story to varying degrees. Uh, the plant uses a new process developed by RTFT, so that Rio Tinto plant, to extract high-purity scandium oxide from the waste streams of titanium dioxide production. Commissioning is underway and output will ramp up to three tons of product annually. The future addition of more modules could increase capacity. And we have a quote from Rio Tinto Iron and Titanium Managing Director Stéphane Leblanc. 
Quote, in less than two years, we have gone from testing a process to extract this critical material in a lab to being able to supply approximately 20% of the global market. This is a testament to our team's capacity to think outside the box and deliver on our commitments. Well, bravo to Rio Tinto. You know, finally, I, it's, glad, it's great to have Rio Tinto in the news and have something really positive here. This is what we can do when you start to partner up with government and get the job done. Because are we just going to wait for mining investors to fund these things? Because otherwise, like, we're competing against people that are not waiting for the, you know, the mining investor to invest in it and are not worried about the uh, vicissitudes of the financial markets. They are simply going ahead. So thankfully, we are going ahead here in Quebec. And look, now we're producing 20% of the global supply of scandium in less than two years. So a very nice, happy story. Scandium oxide has application in solid oxide fuel cells, lasers, lighting products, or as an additive in high-performance alloys. Tosico has a big shakeup. And uh, so that's one for the uh, local Canadian mining community. Tosico is, you know, well-known players on the scene for a long time here. And their CEO, Russell Hallboyer, and COO John McManus will retire at the end of the month. And so there's a shakeup over there. You can read about that on northernminer.com. And finally, Wood McKenzie, the consultancy, is buying raw skill. So this is by Cecilia Jamasmi, and this is also quite interesting. So Wood McKenzie announced on Friday it had acquired raw skill, a privately owned company and leader in metals and materials supply chain intelligence, boosting the consultancy's expertise in energy transition. Neil Anderson, president of Wood McKenzie, said the business combination added market-leading analysis, data, and insight on battery raw materials to its current offer. And we have a quote, Neil Anderson, quote, combining raw skills capabilities with Wood McKenzie's reinforces our ability to provide comprehensive integrated analysis across the energy and metals and mining value chain. And Roskill was founded in 1930 in London. So they have been around for a while. So a very interesting acquisition. So those are your news stories. Now let's take a look at metal prices. Turning to metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And as we've started to do here, we're going to start with the 10-year bond, which is at 1.48%. So that is 0.02% lower than last week. Gold is trading at $1,779.81 per ounce. That is... $88 lower than last week's quote. Silver is trading at $25.87 per ounce. That is $1.84 lower than last week. Platinum is trading at $1,066.87. That is $90 lower than last week. Palladium is trading at $2,605.87. That is $158 lower than last week's quote. And turning to our industrial metals, copper is trading at $4.18 per pound. That is $0.37 cents lower than last week. Aluminum is trading at $1.08 per pound. That is $0.05 cents lower. Lead is $0.03 cents lower. Lead is $0.03 cents lower at $0.97 cents per pound. And nickel is 44 cents lower at $7.86 per pound. Tin is at $14.38 per pound. That is 62 cents lower than last week. Cobalt is higher at $20.19. That is 89 cents higher than last week. And zinc is 7 cents lower at $1.30 per pound. What do we see? Everything is down and the dollar is up, bond yields are down, suggesting that there is a bit of a risk-off environment. What it really says to me is that the whole 
reflation trade, the whole reopening has started to hit a speed bump. Will it continue? We shall see. But there is a bump in the road, and we had to slow down, and that's what we're doing. And those are your metal prices. And coming up, we have a feature presentation from the Global Mining Symposium, Nickel, the battleground for EV battery supremacy. And this features Ken Hoffman, senior expert for McKinsey's Basic Materials Institute from McKinsey & Company, the famed consultancy. He co-leads the firm's EV battery material research group and has worked on over 50 EV value chain client projects. His team looks at the impact on raw materials due to the rapid development of advanced battery technologies. He has co-written articles on nickel and EVs and a cobalt and lithium paper. Prior to McKinsey, Ken was the global head of metals and mining research for Bloomberg Intelligence. Quite the expert here. And this is moderated by Frick Ells, executive editor of Mining.com. It's a fascinating discussion on the nickel market and really is going to echo a lot of what you've heard in this show so far. So I hope you enjoy it and we will see you on the other side. Good morning, Ken. Good morning. I had a look back today. Uh, the first time we spoke was can't believe it is now six years ago <clears throat> when you were with uh, Bloomberg Intelligence and we spoke about uh, copper. So and your knowledge of the industry is obviously very wide and deep. But I, today I want to just get into nickel because it's, it's called the devil's copper. There's all sorts of things going on in the nickel industry that's not always uh, easy to parse. So, yeah, you are in charge of uh, electric vehicles research uh, at McKinsey. I imagine that part of the business is only growing and will grow. So, yeah, let's jump right into it. I guess we cannot start any discussion about uh, nickel without mentioning uh, Ting Chan and what they've done for the industry. Not, not just in March when with their announcement on nickel sulfate and MAT. But uh, since they started with NPI and kind of uh, upended uh, the market to an extent, I see you know nickel fell almost twenty percent on that news, but it's made back half of that by now, so it's back at eighteen eighteen thousand. How do we read the long term, longer term implications of their new process? Or it's not a new process, but they seem to have commercialized it. Just to step back a bit and, and, and sort of talk about the world of EVs and, and, and why Ken Chan's announcement is uh, probably, you know, so controversial. And Jim Lennon and I spoke about this just the other day. We, we take have different takes uh, on the nickel market. You know, the EV market did not exist a few years ago. Literally, if you go back a decade, I think there was like 22,000 EVs sold in the world. Uh, there was 4.3 million sold last year. If it weren't for a chip shortage, you'd probably hit six or seven million units this right. year. And so about 200,000 metric tons of, of nickel uh, went into EVs last year. It'd be 300 plus probably this year. And, and if you look at class one nickel, which is sort of gets into the heart of the modder, you know, that's about 20 to 25 percent of all nickel in the world is just going to EVs right now. And so when we look at things, we sort of say there's class one nickel and there's class two nickel. The, the brilliance of, of Tin Shan was, was years ago recognizing, you know, all the miners knew there was an awful lot of nickel uh, in Indonesia. That, you go mm-hmm. back in old notes, everybody knew it was there, but it was it, it had a lot of iron with it. And the Chinese made the great discovery, hey, I'm making stainless steel out of this stuff. Um, why don't I just uh, melt it down a bit, uh, concentrate it to, you know, 6 to 12 percent nickel content and take that material and, and sort of put it into, um, into stainless steel. And, and, and at the time, you can remember, you know, the world was really running short nickel. The price of nickel got up to, you know, it was nearing $50,000 a metric ton. And all of a sudden, this this new evolution came out uh, of a sort of a, a quick and cheap way to uh, to mass produce nickel units. That you know sent the price all the way down to as low as eight thousand dollars a metric ton. And, and and many in the industry feel very very burnt by that. And so when Tin Shan comes out and says, "Aha, guys, you know we have a new process that will mass produce more nickel to the market, even no matter how much the EV battery market makes," uh, we we have a problem few few things. Um, one, you know, it's not a new process that, that they've provided. 
it's, it's actually a process that's been around from the mid 70s and and we're not quite sure you know it hasn't really worked fantastically so far uh, and it hasn't been a very cheap process as well so so that's sort of part of the issue and and then the question is the purity there of the material you know ev batteries you'll actually get a quote for parts per billion of your detriments in that nickel quality in order for it to work in a battery and one of the number one detriments you don't want in a in nickel is is iron. Iron really messes up a, a cell chemistry. So so there's an awful lot of of problems out there. Now that being said, we hope some of this works because you know about every thousand dollar move in nickel adds about eighty cents per kilowatt hour to the price of, of a vehicle. And you know if you were to see say a twenty or thirty thousand dollar increase in nickel. You know, that would be a 10 to $15, you know, you're, you're talking about 20 to 30% increase in the cost of just the battery. Yeah. And, and our single biggest fear for the nickel market is you're going to boom. Prices are going to go up so high because of EVs. EVs move on to something else. And nickel sort of has done what it's always done, which is a huge boom and then a big bust. And that, that's sort of our biggest fear. Right. Yeah, it's almost uh, the chicken and egg situation. You have to have uh, expensive nickel for people to mine it. Uh, but it gets too expensive, uh, you know. Yeah, like you said, it's uh, it's a boom. You move on. Yeah. So I had a look yesterday just on you know LFP batteries, it's sort of come out of nowhere. And according to the the data I saw, they're up to fifteen percent market share overall already from basically a, a standing start. But one of the slides you showed me uh, of the, the you know sort of the research path or the development path of uh, EV batteries or batteries in general, lithium ion uh, batteries, it's all, nickel is all over it. Nickel is sort of the, the golden thread that goes through all of it. What is the future of uh, battery chemistries or cathode chemistries for that matter? Um, LFP batteries have actually been around. They're an iron-based cathode uh, battery. They've been around for 40, feet, 40 years. Um, so they are definitely not a new technology. There's one company that has really done the best job with that, and that's a company in China called CATL. But when we look at sort of energy density, and, and, and so remember, when, when people buy a vehicle, Vehicle. And we, we survey 15,000 people around the world every year. And it doesn't matter whether you're in Norway or, or you're in Toronto or you're in Japan. Everyone tells us the exact same thing. It doesn't matter. They say, I have an internal combustion engine out there in the driveway. It gets me six to 900 kilometers range and it recharges in you know six to eight minutes. I'll mm -hmm. move to an electric car when it can pretty much you know, replicate that. And so in order to do that, energy density is, is one of the most important parts of a battery. How many electrons can I put into a certain amount of space? Um, LFP batteries, if we, if we look, and I'll try to annotate this, LFP batteries are sort of right here. They're about 170 watts per kilo. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much where they sit today. Nothing has happened in terms of making them really much more energy dense than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, if we look at the best in class nickel high nickel batteries, they're at about double, about 300 watts per kilo. So, so why all of a sudden do we hear LFP? One of it is, is optionality. Um, as I said, if you did you know, 4 million cars consume 200,000 tons of nickel on average for there's a product mix there but you know if what if we get to the world which needs you know 80 to 100 million vehicles if i multiply that number out there and the, the nickel market for class one nickel is a million and a half tons you very quickly run out of nickel and yeah. so the car makers have sort of said look we need many chemistries just in case and LFP has worked for two reasons. One, it's very inexpensive. Um, you're probably paying about $85 to $90 if you're a huge uh, OEM for your right. uh, high nickel batteries, and you're paying like $60 to $65 for LFP. And they've been able to sort of, as they make these vehicles, they're, they're taking out all the packaging they used to need. They used to need all this. We ripped down about 15 uh, EVs over time. We've noticed that the transition of a lot less packaging, a lot less wiring, um, a lot less copper, actually. And But in that space you took out all the packaging, you can put in more chemicals. And so you're, instead of putting in 50 units of LFP battery and getting, you know, seven, you know, 100 kilometer range, you can put in 100 and get, you know, 200 kilometer range. And it's just enough for that low end, very inexpensive vehicle for them to get some market share. Will it take over the marketplace? Absolutely not. Um, right. you, you, because consumers in the West don't want 200, 300 kilometers. They want, you know, six, 800 kilometers. Is there some sort of theoretical maximum for LFPs? I mean, they, they have caught up, uh, you know, I, 
I believe they're they sort of yeah, well, they're kind of on par with the you know the older uh, high nickel uh, content cathodes. Uh, that, can can yeah, it that, that's sort of this. They're, they're getting sort of close to the first uh, area. It, it depends, uh, and that's a typical consulting answer, right? It, it, and, and that is, could we move to a solid state battery? So um, uh, a solid state battery now. Do electrons, would they rather flow through a liquid or flow through something solid? Of course, they want to flow through something liquid. It's a lot easier. Yeah. But with solid state batteries, when you hear that term, it's changing the anode. And so the anode today is roughly 40% of the weight. It's, it's, it's graphite. Um, sometimes they, they put a little tiny bit of silicon in there. But if you can actually take another material other than graphite, say lithium metal, uh, and put that in, instantly what you do is you reduce the weight by 40%, so you increase your density significantly. And two, you can charge a lot faster because that's you charge through the anode and to charge through lithium is a lot quicker and faster than charging through the anode. The, the problem is lithium's a real bugger of a material. It degrades crazy fast. And so solid state is supposed to, if I have a solid surface against it, hopefully I can keep it from degrading and having a long enough life that it makes a useful material. There are companies out there um, that are taking a, a, an approach to a, to a solid state battery using lithium metal, or even there's some um, like uh, solid energy systems and MIT spin out out of Boston that's using liquid electrolyte with a uh, lithium metal anode, but using LFP. And, mm -hmm. and so their idea is that would get, we think, you know, 360 to 380 watts per kilo. So sort of put you, you know, sort of, you know, with what we think might happen in say 2024, um, mm -hmm. it's not the you know, six, you know, five or 600 watts per kilo of an NMC battery, but it would be a lot better than today. And that, that could give you a pretty decent range. Um, and so we'll have to see the developments there. And uh, I see, I mean, 2030 is not that far away. And then we're looking at 750 kilowatt hours and real solid state or complete solid state. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, most companies are trying to get this onto the market in, in, in the next, you know, four or five years. We've probably done uh, work on six or seven of the leading solid state batteries out there or new technologies out there. Uh, you know, the, if, you, if you hear all the hype, I mean, in reality, where all these guys sort of are is it works in the lab. Great. Um, mm -hmm. It works in sort of batch processing. Great. They've sent those samples along and we call pre-A samples to the automakers. And the automakers are sort of looking at all these different uh, areas. Now it's like, well, how do we actually get from there to a battery that works on a, you know, that's in a car, working in a car? And that's, you know, we think it's going to take four to five years for that to, to, to work. Um, a big thing is what goes on in China. There's a lot of rumblings out of China that they already have workable solid state batteries in their vehicles today. Okay. Um, and, and, and remember the move to 811 chemistries, that higher nickel chemistry was really spurred by the move in China to, to put those into the batteries as, as early as 2018. So, mm -hmm. so China can really move the rest of the world's needle very quickly uh, if, if that competitive pressure is there. So maybe we should go back a little bit further upstream. I think the presentation, you predict that there could be a class one nickel shortage uh, as soon, you know, within two, within two years. And I mean, the, the, the demand side is, is pretty much there. And if you're adding a million tons in, in demand just from, from the battery sector out of a market that's what, two and a half million today, I mean, how can, how can prices not go up? Uh, we worry a lot about prices, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, again, the, you know, right now there's a bottleneck on, on EV production, and that bottleneck is, is batteries and chips. The world is very short battery capacity and very short chip capacity, as you've heard in the press. And so we're actually, there's a limit on nickel demand at the moment just because they just can't make the cars. Um, and, you know, demand far exceeds uh, supply. Um, we will see many, many more vehicles come on the market over the next few years. We believe the chip and the battery uh, usage will, you know, those capacity bottlenecks will be alleviated. And that is going to put an awful lot of pressure on, on nickel. So from that standpoint, you that's why you've seen, you know, Tesla again and again and again say, we are worried about nickel. Uh, you saw Volkswagen and their battery, they say, we are worried about nickel. They are trying to set up long-term deals. Now, the, the interesting part, uh, you know, they want these deals for a few reasons. One, they want to make sure they have supply. Um, and so you've seen uh, companies trying to secure supply, for example, what BASF and Norilsk have done in, in Finland. Um, and, 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 you know, these companies are trying to secure supply because, one, they're, they're afraid of nickel units. Two, 
remember that you know regulators in Europe and most likely in the U.S. are asking for your ESG footprint. So they eventually are going to tax you on your carbon, your water, your sulfur, whatever contents in that vehicle because they don't want the EV to be a dirty car. And, and so I want to make sure if I'm an OEM that I understand what is in there, you know. And so and that's another thing that that sort of hurts Tin Shan that the process they're using is very very uh, sulfur uh, uh, use. And so you know could this tax yourself out of the market and you know how big could the tax be well to currently in the european union the tax on internal combustion engines is fifteen thousand euros a vehicle on average it's a very large tax and so that puts a lot of value on trying to keep as as strong of an esg uh or as good, well, good of an esg footprint as possible and when we break down the ev where most of the emissions come from today it's nickel yeah, so we know China has cornered the, the cobalt supply chain all the way from the mines in the DRC to the converters, obviously the battery makers, etc. Aren't they uh, basically far down the road when it comes to nickel and Indonesia? With uh, I know that Tingsan itself is building huge uh, smelters there because of the uh, ore, ore ban, or export ban. Um, are, they, are they locking in supply from Indonesia, which seems to be you know, the one place you can still go or the best place to go if you're looking for lots of nickel at this point? Yeah, I mean, I, you have seen massive investments of, of China into Indonesia, so that is true. Um, you're seeing other country, you know, companies in there, Aramets in there. You know, there are some other companies in there. And you're starting to see sort of some of the juniors in Australia and Canada get some interest. You know, talk to Mark Selby over at Canadian Nickel. You know, he's talking about his deposits. There's quite a few deposits elsewhere. The, the big problem actually outside of Indonesia is is smelters. Um, you know, finding mines is actually a lot easier than getting the, the billion or two it's going to take to put in a, uh, a compliant smelter. Um, and particularly if you start to look at, you know, we always say, you know, lock yourself in with an OEM because the OEM is going to tell you what product they need in the future, not what product they need today. So if I put in a, a mine today and I'm, I'm looking to make MHP, that's great because they want MHP to pick their nickel sulfate. But look at what Tesla's saying. Look at what Volkswagen's saying. They want a nickel powder because they don't want to have all the acids in, 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 the, in the vehicle. They, they actually want to do a broad, dry processing. And, you know, the world production of nickel powder today is minuscule. It's like 30, 40,000 metric tons. You know, if all of a sudden you need a half a million tons of, of powder, where's it going to come from? Who's going to make it? How is it going to be made? And where will it be refined? These are the questions that, you know, need to be answered. And, you know, it's, we're really curious from our perspective, you know, when you see the European Union saying they're putting billions into the EV value stream, if you see the Biden administration saying they're putting billions into it, is it going to go to refining is it, to really help out these miners? Because otherwise, there's only a few smelters in the West. Right, right. You know, even we, uh, our, our sister company, uh, Intelligence, did a, a, a study a while ago on uh, of nickel projects with feasibility studies done in the last five years. And I think the proven and probable reserves on those projects were something like 2.7 million tons contained nickel. I mean, uh, th th there just seems to be a huge gap here. Uh, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where, how it's going to, how it's going to be filled if you're not going to a deep sea tailings or an HPL, which seems to be a very tricky thing to do. It's going to be very interesting what happens. So, so I mean, again, if you're the OEM, you're looking at a basket of different technologies. You hope that uh, the nickel industry invests in its industry because nickel's great on the periodic table for making a battery work, um, okay. but they're nervous. And so the, that's why you saw Tesla and Volkswagen uh, both talk about um, high manganese batteries. Manganese market's about 10 times larger than the, than the nickel market. Uh, it's pretty broadly diverse around the world from a geographic standpoint. Um, LMO batteries are making a big uh, comeback. LMO was sort of a, a battery that sort of went out like LFP, but LFP has come back and now people are looking in, in looking, uh, lithium manganese batteries. So the car companies hope that the, you know, the, that the nickel market comes back they privately wouldn't mind it if the nickel prices went into the low and mid-20s because that's the number uh, mining executives often say they need to see to believe that this is real and they'll make investments. Um, they don't want to see in the 30s or 40s, but but in the low 20s sort of would make some sense for them. And at that point, they hope that, you know, um, we really start ramping up, um, looking for new mines, investing in new mines. Um, you know, and, and really try to provide the product that this industry is going to need. Otherwise, 
you could see sort of what happened with cobalt with the price sparks you know spiking to a hundred thousand everyone is giddy and it's fantastic uh, and then it just collapsed on the other side of that as the chemists sort of say well we actually don't need cobalt and we can find other alternatives and you know you, you reduce the cobalt usage by 90 percent and, and and the price comes back down to, to twenty thousand. so so we don't want that to happen with nickel yeah is there a, a chance we we get a, a bifurcated market that uh, there is a supply chain going into china you know mostly via indonesia maybe philippines and there is a, a esg compliant uh, nickel market and which for which you pay a premium that is uh, kind of everywhere else. It's very possible. You know, I mean, I, I think from a number of different standpoints, um, one of the standpoints is regulations are not only used to clean up the environment, which obviously they, they help, but they're also to, to preserve jobs. And a lot of governments around the world are putting in regulations, not only, you know, they, they really want localization of those assets. Uh, when you move from the production of an internal combustion engine to an EV, you are going to lose a lot of jobs. There's just not, aren't many parts. You're going to see all car dealerships will pretty much go away. They, they make their money on fixing cars. There, there isn't really a lot to fix on an EV. Yeah. Um, and, and so governments realizing they're going to be losing you know, millions and millions of, of manufacturing jobs and, and, and jobs in, in, in uh, fixing of vehicles. How can we keep as many jobs as possible? And localization rules sort of become important. And so. Um, you know, I don't think most governments would have a problem if, if Chinese companies want to invest in their local economy and create jobs and, and bring that material there. I, I think, you know, sending those jobs to China just aren't very interesting for a lot of politicians in the West. Everybody seems to have a, have a list of critical minerals these days, <clears throat> Europe, uh, Canada, the U.S., but it really doesn't really always go much further than that. Uh, I mean, do you see a, a time where there, I mean, there is real money going into supporting the industry? But like you said, building refineries might be, you know, even a bigger task than than building the mines. Is is that what's going to be required? Because there, there, you know, there is. We have demand the YZ Bay's uh, expansion. You know, just in Canada, there there is uh, potential, but um, it's it's a lot of money. I mean, we, we, we actually have been working with a lot of governments around the world. There does seem to be a sincere interest to help this industry. They're trying to figure out the best way to do it. Um, they're trying to find out the way to do it to, um, you know, it, it's a tricky business for them. You know, um, you know, we know the old story. Ever, everyone wants the jobs, but then we don't want the mines and, and the NIMBYs come out. Uh, we've seen that recently with Portugal in, in terms of a lithium mine there. Um, so they're trying to figure out what's the best way to move forward to try to, to do this. Um, Portugal actually did do something that was interesting where they're just going to convert an oil uh, facility that was old and, and very cost competitive into a lithium refinery. So, so there are clever ways to try to get around, uh, you know, preserving jobs and moving to a new economy. Um, and they are, and I think a lot of these governments are asking the right answers. I, I think they don't have a lot of knowledge here. So that's sort of part of our job here to, to, to educate. Um, but but I, I think they, there's a sincere interest to try to help. Uh, and there seems to be real money behind this as well. Um, I, I do think that from the mining industry standpoint, um, don't, you know, when, when Elon Musk came out and was sort of talking, and it's the, I think it was the most hilarious slide ever, and he showed this is the way the mining industry is today, is they, they take the rock and they do a bunch of stuff. It literally says they do a bunch of stuff to it, and then they move it, and they do a lot more stuff to it. You know, our plan is to do a lot less stuff to it here and, and do even less stuff. Um, and, and everyone sort of crucified Musk. He doesn't know anything about mining. And, and, and I granted, uh, it, it's the Musk way to look at the, the world. Yeah. However... I think the mining industry does need to sort of have, often when we, when we talk to miners, there's this, it can't be done any different. This is the way it's done. And I, I think that's incorrect. You know, I, I think now is a really great time to come up with innovative solutions that could be more ESG friendly, that use less chemicals, that use less water, that uses new processing, that, that sort of takes a white sheet to the, to the mine, and then work with the government and saying, hey, um, we really think we can do some really interesting things here. We, we, you know, we'd like to pilot plant this new uh, technology. Could you help us with this or that? And I think governments are really eager, and, both, and OEMs are really eager because they're, you know, they really want it to, you know, they don't want to come out of this saying, you know, we, we really haven't improved the, the world environment. You know, we're doing stuff great. So there's a there's a real interesting area now um, going on where, where new technologies can be brought to market 
And I think miners can be, you know, techies themselves, bringing bringing new and innovative uh, techniques to, to this market. Speaking of novel ways of uh, going about mining, we compiled a list uh, of the 10 largest uh, nickel projects around the world. And number one was Deep Green's nodules in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Now, the, already there's opposition and petitions, and I don't know why Google Google telling us not what to mine and not not to mine type scenarios. What what do you think of of deep sea mining? Is is that something that's gonna that's gonna happen? Does it have to happen if we're if we're all driving in electric cars? It's gonna be interesting. You know, look. Um... OEMs have become very powerful in the world as much as governments as to which nickel we're going to use or not use. Uh, it was Tesla last August that came out publicly and said they would not buy any nickel from a mine that did ocean uh, tailing stuffings. And literally within four or five months, pretty much every nickel mine that was planning uh, to do that, particularly in Indonesia, said they were going to do dry stacking. It was interesting because I was actually talking to a manager of a mine in Indonesia and they were like, you know, Ken, this is this is tough business. Yeah, we're not going to do it. It's going to increase our costs, you know, tenfold in terms of dry stacking relative to just dumping the, the, the waste in the ocean. But, you know, we're in an economic, you know, we're in an earthquake sensitive area. Um, the only place to really put this dry stacking is into deep valleys. Those deep valleys have very diverse uh, eco-climates and we're already seeing people protesting that. And so, you know, how this all works out is going to be really interesting because it, it, it's going to be interesting to see how it does this. So you're right. I have seen it was at the World Wildlife Fund has signed up a whole bunch of automakers to say uh, they, they don't want to procure nickel uh, coming from oceans. Um, so, you know, does this become very widespread and sort of nip it in the bud before it even starts or not? Or do people realize, hey, we need to have these batteries um, and, and therefore we, we have an alternative and, and, and this is, a, you know, a, an open source of it. It's going to be very tricky to, to see. So I think automakers are sort of, a lot of them are sitting back. They're, they're one wondering, do we need the nickel? So that's what I'm saying, you know, do mag does manganese sort of replace nickel? Uh, if it's going to become so problematic for them, uh, what works, what doesn't work, and what can you know keep us uh, uh, sort of ahead of the curve, and, and that's that's sort of the big question right now. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's it's such a huge industry and a growing industry. Uh, we should definitely talk about this uh, more. Always happy to. It's my favorite subject. I'm quite passionate about. It. <laughs> Great. Thank you. As I've been saying on this show so far, it seems like the mining industry narrative is coalescing into one narrative. It has to do with the environment, has to do with geopolitics, has to do with the green economy. And, you know, mining's right at the center of it. Fascinatingly, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you're enjoying your summer. If you want to help out the podcast, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory and share it with your friends. And until next week, take care. This episode of the Northern Miner Podcast is brought to you by Revival Gold and their Bear Track Arnett Gold Project in Idaho. If you want to learn more about Revival Gold, you can find them at revival-gold.com and you can find them on the TSX Venture Exchange at RVG and on the over-the-counter markets at RVLGF.